Okay, we never edit our podcasts, but having got to the end of this podcast, I did just want to do a message directly to anybody who's going to listen to this. My first birth was difficult, was, was very difficult. And that's because of all sorts of things. Um, if you don't want to listen to how a difficult birth can go, then Mark has put a link underneath here that you can click onto. And I just wanted to give a real warning to that. And another thing I wanted to say was, because I love home birthing, I don't want anyone to think that I in any way judge anyone that has whatever birth they have, whether you have an elected cesarean, whether you, I, I don't know, whatever you choose, I, I do not stand in judgment. And I always hope nobody stands in judgment of me for the choices that I've made. I just want this to be just a really open conversation. And I just want everybody to be as kind as they can. So if you would like to just skip to my second extraordinarily um, brilliant birth, then just click on the link that Mark's going to put below. But at the end of the day, both births produced the most beautiful, gorgeous, wonderful, healthy babies. Welcome to How to Stay Married So Far. We're still married. Oh, Sorry if my hair looks wet for those watching on YouTube, that's because it is. Yeah, I haven't absolutely. had time to put makeup on and dry my hair this morning. <laughs> I was trying to do sort of that voice that you, when you're listening, of just How to Stay Married So, so Far. Um, Cut into the chase. This is Can about... I just say that's a gorgeous cup of tea? Oh, brilliant. Really yeah, done nice. with love and care and concern. Now I'm panicking because that... I'm going to want another one. Well, I did it with such tenderness because I knew we were talking about a subject that's very difficult and joyful in equal measure, uh, home birth. Um, we did talk about the decision to have a home birth in another podcast, didn't we? Another chat. Uh, and I'll pop the link for that underneath the, uh, the this video. But it went, we, it, we had so much to talk about with it that we didn't actually get to the point where we talked about the actual no, birth. And we, we thought we were going to talk about both births yeah. and the decision to have birth we didn't even in get, one podcast. Yeah, we didn't even get into labour, did we? No. Um, so all, all the last podcast was was a great series of contractions, emotional contractions. <laughs> um, but I, mean, I think it would be really good to listen to it before this. Though. Yeah, yeah. So head over, it's below here, mm -hmm. head over and listen to that first. But I would, I kind of am pretty confident in guessing that this is going to be quite an emotional chat about the lows that you encountered giving birth to Maddie, the highs you encountered giving birth to Kiki. Uh, I know for a fact I'm going to talk about a, t a sense of total, total lack of control, at times input, and yet at the same time in one of the births feeling quite the opposite actually, but only really in retrospect feeling the opposite. So I mean that's my side. Obviously this is about home birthing, you're the mum, so this is your, how do you feel about having this chat? Well, first of all, apparently there's a 40% increase in a women um, asking about home births. Is that because Basically, everyone's at home? It's because of COVID. I mean, it's, it's a scary mm. place going into hospital and yeah, obviously yeah. you can't spend time. I mean, a friend of mine's scary just places had, and it will, always be, it will always be a bit of a scary place. Maybe. Yeah, and, yeah. All, and also, like a friend of mine's just had a baby and she had to be two days in the hospital on her own with no visitors, not even her husband. So. Wow. Um, yeah, because yeah, of course they're the vulnerable There's a ones, huge they? increase yeah. increase in requests to home birth. Um, yeah, I I do feel nervous about talking about it because I think it's really important. The very first thing I say is I had two very different births, mm. and one was very difficult and traumatic and obviously I've been on loose women for the last 20 years and I've we and we've talked so often about birth and you can only talk about it you know in in in, in for minutes a few minutes each person tells their story um but I know that whenever we do talk about it we get a huge response to it and we also get you know it kind of splits into two schools of thought. Some women want to know and feel like if they just knew everything, if they'd known everything, they would have been so much more prepared emotionally and physically. And they want to know everything, how difficult it was mm. and, and all of that. And, 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 and there's a lot of other women that really believe that that would impact very badly on them if they knew how difficult birth can be, how challenging birth mm. can be. So what I would say is so my first- a sort of willful ignorance in a sense. 
Yeah, ignorance is bliss, I suppose. And I think for a lot of women, that's absolutely true. Yeah. If you go in thinking, God, this is all going to be absolutely terrible. The body closes up, the mind mm. closes up, you can have a much longer birth. But, so what Mark's going to put a link under here. So if you want to... A time code. A time code. So if you want to spool ahead from the more difficult birth and get to the really positive experience of my second birth, in which I approached in a completely different way and, and, and have lots of tips on how to have a great birth then you can do that. But this first birth was definitely, uh, for me, it was, a th it was a thing of nightmares. Mm. I mean, it really was. Um, I, we were just listening to the end of the last chat that we did and we sort of discussed the fact that the house was set up with a birthing pool. Um, you had a midwife that wasn't the one that you'd started out on your pregnancy mm. with. And I, and I didn't. And I'm sure there's nothing wrong with her. It's just mm. fundamentally, you know, when you just don't like Absolutely. somebody at all. Absolutely. And that was part of the reason that I wanted to home birth because... So many people talk about when they're in hospital, they have all these different people mm. coming on and off shifts. And I thought, oh my God, what mm. if I just feel weird with all these people? That's not going to so be just right. So just to recalibrate, I mean, you've kind of answered it there. What were your headline reasons for wanting to home birth? Well, as you know, I'm in, into holistic medicine. Mm. So I was very nervous of intervention. I was nervous that I might... <clears throat> um, fold and ask for an epidural which i was very 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 scared of um I, I didn't want an epidural but i didn't want to be in so much pain that i was screaming for an epidural mm. um i think mostly i because i'd read a lot of books about natural childbirth and about you know that m amazing thing oxytocin that hormone that is released that's a natural painkiller um, really, you need to be in a really good space where you feel relaxed and you... Well, not relaxed, I don't know if that's the right word. Where you feel safe. Mm. Where you feel that you can be very, very... I wanted to go to a visceral place right. if, if, to do this. Right. I wanted to be able to squat and scream like a cow and do all of that stuff that yeah. I know I would have felt too shy to do in front right. of people I didn't know and people that no. weren't like-minded to me, which was that I don't believe that having a baby or being pregnant is an illness. I think it's the most natural mm. thing. And because there was absolutely nothing wrong with me. I was older, but I didn't have any high blood pressure. I was reasonably healthy. I've had a kind of healthy life, not really too much. Please. Um, there wasn't really any reason why I shouldn't have the baby at home and I really liked the whole idea I was born at home which is yeah. weird because I nearly my mum had a terrible birth with me at home and had, so your, that's odd. And had your older sister had her kids at home her second one she had at she home, had home. Yeah. yeah so you'd seen a positive experience of it as well and she'd wanted her first one at home but her partner had who yeah well that's another story didn't want her so she had yeah. it at hospital and she really didn't like it at hospital right. Like she, and that really had stuck in my mind. Like she was really a natural birther. She was a very good birther. And she, I think she had her first baby in eight hours. When I say good birther. I was say, is I, there a suggestion that if you have it quickly, you're. No, no, no. I, I just want to retract, retrace over that. There's not such a thing as yeah. a good birther or a bad birther. She had a good birth. Sure, for her. She, yeah, mm. for her. It, was, it wasn't It was very long and drawn out in the way that mine was. Mm. Um, you know, it was eight hours. She didn't have any interventions. She didn't have any drugs. She didn't have gas in her. She didn't have anything. Mm. So for her, it was a very healthy birth. Mm. But she had wanted absolutely all of her impulse and instinct was saying, get onto your all fours with a beanbag. That's, and she wanted to be in that position, which is quite a classic mm. natural... It's like if you leave a woman, they're probably going to end up like this, squatting down. If you can't, if you're just listening to this, I'm sort of doing a head in hands um, uh, position and squatting down. If you think about it, gravity then mm. pushes the baby down. Mm. So you're just drawn to it. You will just move into that position. And she she was on the bed and she got off this the is bed. Dina. This is, this is my sister. sister. And she went to crouch and the woman said, don't tell me you're planning on having it like that, the midwife. Oh my God. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing you wanted to avoid. Yeah, so that, and, and Dina said that she felt really like mm. awkward and then she just like mm. panicked and her contractions slowed down. And, and, and that, that sort of tallied with all the books that I was reading about feeling in a safe place. You're very close with your partner. You know, in a often, often not always, not always, but often I've heard in hospitals, the the dad is sort of a bit pushed to well, one I mean, side. I've been through, I've been through a hospital birth. Yeah. So and yeah, 
I can't necessarily remember if we, I was necessarily sidelined. I remember being punched a lot by Izzy's mum. Um, I think I didn't, I didn't in any way feel sidelined, but you are, you are in a, it is a theater, theatrical performance. Mm. You're in a situation where no one is, it feels like no one's in control of the situation, but the doctor or the nurse. Or yeah, whatever, the I suppose that's, I yeah, suppose yeah. that's what it, I suppose I wanted. I mean, I remember, I think I said this before though, I remember the fact that we were offered low key lighting was a big deal. Exactly. Yeah, My apps, oh, that's a really good point. Like, I had this irrational fear of strict lighting, like a mm. kebab shop. I was imagining mm. I was going to be in a kebab shop on my back with my knees up in stirrups, knowing from everything I read that the baby's then got to go down the road and up the road and down the hill and around the corner to get out. It doesn't make any sense to me. And mm. lots of people say, I mean, let's not forget, the reason women were put on their back with their legs up in stirrups, because that worked better for male gynaecologists. Well, it's like so many... They could see. It's like so many things in life. We're only just, what, with Black Lives Matter, with feminism and everything, you realise that everything is structured to suit a particular cultural approach, which is generally white men. Yeah. Um, for me, for the idea for me to be uh, under that system where she was around, she was going to be coming around Christmas... Christmas Day babies are very mm. rare. What was her due date again? It was the 23rd. 23rd. Which is when I went into labour. Yeah. Um, and I so I was worried that they might start saying, mm, we should push you along a bit, mm. have a pessary, have a this, have a that. And all of that I know, I believe, for me, it's right for other people, is not good. I don't want to start a whole stage that then you're pushing a baby. I think babies stay there until they're mm. ready to come out. Okay, and so going back to when you went into labour and, and the start of contractions and all that, I mean, my first memory, because you've obviously, you, you went through it, so it's going to be far more your story. I, my first memory of all of it was, as I've said before, a lack of control, a lack of input, and a kind of just doing that and whistling Dixie and hoping for the best, really. I thought the practical things I can do is ensure that the, the water, the, the water, what was it? The, Birthing pool. Birthing pool. Didn't leak. Which it did. Which it did. Um, and just ensured that whatever I could manage, I could manage. But I knew that you wanted your sister there. I knew that we had a woman that you weren't. But at this point, we didn't know. I didn't really say. I know, I know you didn't like her or didn't get on with the, your midwife that much. But You hadn't really spent any time. I had no comprehension of how a, how much of a bad fit it all was. And, and so my first memory was walking around Dulwich Park with you get, going into labour. With you having initial contractions, rather, sorry. You know, the days before. It was like before Christmas, wasn't it? Do you actually remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I vividly remember walking around. But that, around was with, that was with Kiki. <laughs> was it? Yeah, oh. yeah. No, but that's all right. It's all right. I mean, they do all So blend. what happened in the... What... So what happened on the day that I went to birth? So remember, I've, I've wanted this birth because I want to be in the positions that I want to be. I want to be screaming, shouting. I want to just be totally free. In, in in the way that I birthed this baby. So on the 23rd, and it was about, it was about 11 o'clock in the morning, um, we were in our bedroom. You were in the hall, I remember it so clearly, and I just got this, Bruh! I thought, shit, this is it. Mm. And I, I was so, so shocked. Mm. And it wasn't my water's breaking, it was a contraction. I was so shocked that it would happen on the due date. Mm. And uh, I really was I, was, I was a bit freaked out. So my very first thing was I was freaked out, not good. So freaked out and um, called the midwife, spoke to the midwife. She said, oh, you, you're ages away from it, it's fine. Just relax and just, you know, what they do. Uh, so there was a slow build up through that day. And um, I suppose if we cut to the, cut to the, to the chase, Fairly soon, it got very, very painful, didn't it? Mm. Um, and I was frightened fairly quickly. Fear and childbirth do not go well together. Mm. When you are frightened, you... This would this sound really odd. If somebody had said this to me when I was pregnant, I wouldn't have known what they meant. In no way is it a relaxing thing, or can it be a relaxing thing, childbirth? But in the same way, you have to relax and go with it. And I'll mm. speak more about that in the second birth. But in this first birth, I went to a place of fear. What happens when you go to a place of fear is all the blood rushes to where it is needed most. Somebody explained this to me afterwards. So basically your uterus, 
almost goes white with how the blood goes somewhere else for fear or flight mm. because you're going to run and it becomes very tight. Mm. So I, I went into a place of no instead of yes. So every time I had a contract, no, no, mm. no, screaming, pulling myself in, just absolute panic, absolute panic. Got into the birthing pool. Every time I got into the birthing pool, it felt like I was being electrocuted. And that was a huge emotional, mental like mess up because I had been convinced that I was going to get into the water and it was going to be amazing. Mm. And I was just going to float and it was going to. That's, right. that's why I say. Reading your book, you? Yeah, if you're too rigid with what you mm. think it's going to be like, you're then constantly dealing with these hurdles that you've then got to get over and you can't because you're dealing with this. Is that because you're in enormous... a sense trying to achieve the perfect vision that you've established for yourself at some point yeah. you've written? I got in... locked in. Yeah, I got yeah. locked into what it was going to be perfect, like. It's a bit and... like running a marathon. You think yeah. this is how I was going to do this bit. This is how yeah. I was going to do that bit. Yeah. And the funny thing, again, as a pregnant woman, you hear all the time, whatever you do, don't get too rigid with mm. your birth plan because your birth plan doesn't necessarily get... And what you do is you go, yeah, for other people, it yeah, didn't yeah, yeah. work. I know and, what I want to do. And if you listen to the previous podcast, I talked about how I'd signed up for yoga, I'd signed up for antenatal classes, all of this, but I didn't actually go. Mm. So I hadn't actually prepared for this birth. I was actually really, really tired. I'd worked up to the last minute. I was older, I was 38, and I was getting very tired. I was getting tired quickly. It's interesting though, um, because I don't remember the age thing ever being a consideration. Because I never think of you, or certainly I never then thought of you as being older than me. It was just. Oh, well, you're called a geriatric mother no, no, after no. 35. Well, no, I realised that. And I think I heard that phrase at one point. Mm. And I think it was the only moment, really early on, I thought, all oh, right, there's an. All oh, right, this is different to when, I, when we had Fleur and Izzy. All oh, right, that is different. But I don't remember. That didn't then sort of translate into a level of panic or fear for me. If, I, if you'd have told me at the point that you went into. Uh, you know, started having contractions and pain, and you, you're right, you were not dealing with it in the way that you would later deal with Kiki. Mm. There is a good if, story coming. Yeah, yeah, if you, if you were to tell me that then 36 hours later or whatever it was, I, I would have been even more certain that we should have gone into hospital at that earlier point. Because the, the way you thank were... Thank God I didn't yeah. go into hospital. Oh my God, thank God. If I had gone into hospital with this birth, I would have ended up having a caesarean. No mm. doubt about it. And I did not want a caesarean. Caesarean to me is a major operation. I have to pick up, pick around this really carefully it... when I talk about it on Loose Women, but I just do not understand why people elect to have a caesarean. I just, for me, I did not want to, I've been in caesareans and I just mm. didn't, I just, I mean, obviously if you need one, then it's the most incredible invention yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's extraordinarily safe and hundreds of, millions of women have them, but to choose to have one, or to have one because it's getting a bit tough. I had, I, I know somebody that said to me, not a word of a lie, she said, after those first few contractions, I thought, I'm not doing this, this is horrible, I'll just play acted till I got a caesarean. Mm. I mean, right, I'm gonna put, know, so, I'm gonna put uh, my cards on the table, because when I when I look back, obviously, I've conflated walking around the park with Kiki's birth with, with Maddie's, but when I think back to this blow-by-blow blow account that you're gonna give, or you're giving, it, you know, one, they say that one of the key components of any trauma, so abuse, sexual abuse, child abuse, you know, neglect and all that, is that you kind of, there's a, what happens in the brain is there's an elision. You kind of, it, it just goes. It's not like you've even got a memory of it. It's, it's, it's hidden by a sort of self-protective process. Mm. And if I actually take myself back to it, which I'm doing now as you're talking quite stridently, because I'm a very visual person, I can remember so many things. I can remember three, four moments where it spins into vivid colour, mm. which is much further down the way than here. Um, and none of them are pleasant. No, and I mean, I don't want to go into the absolute detail because it bore the pants off everybody. But enough, suffice to say, the fact that I was really scared, the fact that I had to climb that mountain of like, oh God, it's not happening in, in, in the water. Oh, oh my God, mm. but it's, it's worse than the water. And on and on and on and getting more and more exhausted and screaming no with every single contraction. I was basically closing down my body and it was getting harder and harder. She was never in distress. Mm. She was, the midwife was giving up fairly quickly because she wanted Christmas, suggesting that we got an ambulance, but there was nothing wrong. Thank God that my sister was there to be on, in contact constantly with the, our homeopath who I've been with but the midwife looked at me years. at one point and implored me, said, you need to get your wife to a hospital. She tried to override Dina. It was the worst moment I remember oh, because I remember thing. thinking, 
you were on the bed, you looked distressed, you weren't in a good place, an expert, a medical expert's telling me one thing, and I've got, with all due respect, obviously my opinion on this has shifted over the years, I'm listening to your sister and talking about awful. words that meant nothing to me. All these homeopathic, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. I felt like I was in a living hell. Yeah. And I remember thinking, and I think that's possibly why I kind of almost black out from it, because I thought, I am literally powerless here. Mm. I am literally powerless here, and a woman I've just met is in trouble. I don't know what the nature of that trouble is, whether they're going to lose the baby or lose just my wife. We no, 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 but it was relatively <laughs> nine months, you know, a year ago. I'd only met you a year ago. The year, the December before, we were annihilated drunk in Bristol, rolling around the street. Um, and I remember, you know, and Dina was great, don't get me wrong, but I remember feeling extraordinarily at sea, usurped, no function, no purpose, and then a medical woman cutting your sister out of it because she thought it was all nonsense at that point looked at me and said, you need to get your wife to a hospital and an A&E department. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? And I'm looking going, we need to Did go. Did you say that? I and never she knew looked that. At, I remember her coming up and looking at me Good and she God. pointed at me like that. I never knew that. I at never which point that. I must have gone out and talked with Dean. I must have remonstrated with her. There must have been someone. And I do remember coming down to what was then the back door and having to give, having to give myself a whiskey because I was like, what the fuck? And then looking at the birthing pool and it was pouring all over the kitchen. So I distracted myself. Yeah, it was just awful horrendous. Fear. Awful no, fear. no, but in a different... No, 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 no. But for me to recognise that it was awful for you doesn't doesn't take anything from how difficult it was for me. That is an or I can imagine how horrendous that would be to see somebody that I love with my unborn child in such distress. And you know, I mean, highlights were I remember my waters hadn't broken, and she she um, decided to break my waters in midst in the midst of a contraction and. Mm levels of screaming I didn't even know that I could get to it was just mm. I mean let's fast forward a bit it was truly truly awful it was the pain was unbearable I wasn't coping we were going up and down the stairs yes oh it was just it went on and on I remember at one point running downstairs and they were all upstairs and I got the key and I was panicking and I was trying to escape. Mm. And I was like, if they just, if I just get out the door, if I just get out the door mm. now while they're all upstairs, oh, then then, then, then I can there. run away and then this will stop. Mm. And then another contraction hit me and, I, and it was like something out of a horror movie where I went, it's inside <laughs> me. Um, as I keep saying, it gets really good. Second one. Long story short. She did eventually come at 5 a.m. on Christmas morning. But that, that moment, just to not gloss over it, was... It, it, I, when she landed on the floor, there was a beat where neither of us knew if she was alive. Mm. And, that, and that, you know... It's only a beat. It, it, and then she was like, no, 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 it was a beat. But I don't, I, again, I just think you, she took you, first you breath. knew what was going on. I, I didn't. I'd seen just total carnage and horror. I was pumping away on the gas and air because I couldn't bear or take any of it anymore. Uh, you, Do you remember you, when I went to you? Because she said she's transitioning. And I was like, oh, because when I heard that word transition, I thought, this is it, we're going. And then I went into this incredible, like, ah. yeah, 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 and yeah. then it's made. Yeah. And I went to you, sick, sick. Oh, you, yes. you got a pop pop. And I just threw in, threw up into the it was blood. So insufficient for the vomit as well. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, and so, you know, she came and she was absolutely 100% fine and I hadn't needed to go to the hospital and I hadn't needed a cesarean, mm. which is what I hadn't, I didn't want. And most of my, m the majority of people I know have had a cesarean and it's, t and it's, and they're totally fine. There's nothing wrong with having a cesarean. I just, I just didn't want one. I didn't want an operation. Um, but it was why I was flabbergasted that when you got pregnant with Kiki, you wanted to do it again. I mean, I suppose the, you know, the age old thing of if, if, me if our bodies held the true memory of giving birth, most women wouldn't have a baby oh, again. You would. Well, the, the awful thing was, I had ringing in my ears what my mum had always told me. She said, Mother Nature is the most evil mm. thing because you have your baby and then it wipes you. After about two years, it mm. wipes your memory. So, and then you're being wheeled, this is what she said, wheeled down the corridors in hospital and you hear the screams and you're reminded and you're taken back to your torture. Mm -hmm. And I mean, <laughs> the days after I had her, I was very, I'm so mindful because I don't want to scare people, but we've already told people you can scroll ahead if you didn't want to mm -hmm. hear the worst thing. So I am skipping over a lot of it, but I was very, 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 very traumatised after. I did, I did, I remember crying on the phone to my homeopath for a good hour and just saying, I just feel like I was dragged off and tortured and mm. I and I I don't know how I'm ever going to ever be able to get over this and it was really 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 bad. Mm. Um you know 
So a salutary tale that really, you know, I, I should have looked after myself better. I should have, um, you know, just... You know, oh, but I suppose I the, positives, the positives to take out of it are that even given all of that stuff that wasn't right in it, the end result... You know, what it, I, I remember when, I, when she handed me the baby, she said... There, you got it the way you wanted it, didn't oh, you? Do you remember right. that yeah, when she said I that? Do, I do. Like what I'd yeah. wanted was a thing it's was like a spoiled brat thing. Yeah. She was, it was like, about no, Christmas I day. wanted to have my baby born morning. at home, and she was born at five a.m. Yeah. on Christmas morning. But then I suppose the other thing to remind oneself, you know, if I go back to I wasn't in the birth of Fleur, but you know, it's always, a, and I mean this in the sort of inverted commas, it's always a drama. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's never going to be easy. No. I mean, wish it was for women, but it's never going to be huge. easy. It's a huge thing because and, it's the most incredible. Yeah. miracle that there, it will ever yeah. happen so you're naturally going to be drawn to those yeah. moments of wobbles but the fact of the matter is we had a really you had a really traumatic at times one and it was fine so that it itself, was fine and yeah. i didn't have any stitches and i didn't mm. have to be cut and i didn't have to do anything but it was it was very it was way more difficult than i thought so did you have a resolve when you were when you got pregnant with kiki to, uh, and in fact, you should go and listen to uh, another one of the podcasts we did because before Kiki, obviously, there were a couple of um, miscarriages as well, mm. weren't there? So it was mm. quite a, it wasn't just a story of had baby two years, five years, four years, had another no. baby. It, it was a very t -t 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 journey. Yeah, so so Kiki was just, it was just so, so extraordinary to be pregnant with Kiki. It was mm. just so extraordinary and because I really I had we believed. Were both on, on a high that you were. Because at that Total point, high. I did know that you were an old Total mom. high. And don't forget, I thought I had had a miscarriage with mm. Kiki. And when we went to get the scan, I think we were about four months. Uh, I, and they said, no, no, not only have you not had a miscarriage, but she's bigger than for her dates. Mm. So she, you're not going to have a miscarriage. And I didn't believe them. I never forget. <laughs> We'd gone to that doctor in yeah, Harley, Harley Street, Street and we yeah. were walking down the road. And I just kept saying to you yeah. that she's not. It, it, she's gone. She's not. I just could not. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sweetie. It was such a... Um, I just could not believe that she was there. I just no. couldn't believe she was there. And because of that, I think I was enormously uh, protective of, of my pregnancy. And because I felt some stuff had run away with me, with the birth and everything, with Maddie... You know, Maddie was just such a gorgeous, gorgeous child, wasn't she? She really was, and a lovely baby. And it was just after a very difficult birth and everything, she was just, and I was so in love with Maddie. And then to be pregnant with Kiki and to felt that we'd lost her, I was absolutely the epitome of the lioness. Mm. I was just like, if an argument blew up, I wouldn't be around it. I wouldn't be around the argument, mm. you know. I think also when I was pregnant with, with Maddie, it was a very traumatic, it was the first year of marriage and it was just mm. difficult, wasn't it? We were finding out a lot about each other, so mm. I was quite stressed. Well, with Kiki, you weren't, I wasn't drinking. I mean, you know, I know that doesn't You'd necessarily mean that it was a completely easy time. We were getting it. on better. We had this beautiful first child who is now four, three, yeah. four. So she was really, mm. you know, self-sufficient in lots of ways. And it was just the most, the happiest of times. I ate really well. I went to yoga. I went to my antenatal. I looked after myself. I rested. And you've got to remember, I'm now 42. Mm. So mm. 42 and having a home birth? Mm. You know, so I... And well, I was far more, as I say, I was far, far more mindful of your geriatric nature only because of all the miscarriages. And then there was a real feeling going into, you can't forget there was a feeling going into Kiki that this really might not happen. You know, we mm. wanted another child now and mm. we just thought, oh shit, this might not Crazy, happen. It's amazing to think that I just was had the courage or the stupidity to have... <laughs> amazing, yeah. Well, that's so, what I mean. So I made this absolute decision that it had gone so wrong paying for a private, independent midwife and all mm. of this. That I just went to my local midwife at the... Um, the dogs are whining dogs at are us whining. now. Do we need to pause and feed the dogs? No. Now, <laughs> now that they know we've acknowledged them, they could carry on. Let's carry on. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just went to the, the, my GP mm. and the, um, what are they called? The community midwife is absolutely lovely. So I'd made a huge mistake. I should have done that the first time yeah, around. Yeah. And, she, and she said, no, I will, or somebody else, or this person, or that. And you'll meet us all and it'll be one of us that comes. But in my head, I was thinking, I'm going to really hold off until the last minute before we have you around. Mm. <laughs> 
Oh, God, I remember that. Yeah, yes. and she gave us a really stern warning. Yeah. She said, you must have me the minute yeah. you must call me. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah, actually, yeah. we listened to that. We you... said, of course, we're going to be safe and we're going to do yeah. that. But anyway, so this time I was really... My sister couldn't face another birth. She said, I just couldn't. I'll never go in another birth again. I haven't been in the first one. So our dear friend, my homeopath for 20, 30 years, said she would come and stay with us for the week before mm. I went into labour. And she did. And uh, Kiki, I went into labour a few days after when uh, my due date. And we had we this time... We were watching time, Rick Stein. Watched the whole nice, of Rick nice, Stein. Nice set dressing of Rick Stein, weren't we? And what was really different was... I was relaxed. I had read, I had read stuff, but this time I'd actually taken it I'd done in. done all the hypnobirthing as well. And the most important difference between our first birth and our second birth, also my cervix had opened once, so it was going to open again a bit easier, was that we did hypnobirthing. Mm. And I, I spoke about this years ago on um, Channel 5, The Right Stuff. And um, the NHS took that, a bit from that episode, oh, yeah. and then play it to new mums. And so for years, all my life since then, people have come up to me and go, thank you so much for that thing about hypnobirthing. My wife did it. We loved it. So mm. I really can't recommend it highly enough. And um, so I got the book and I did the relaxation and we, we had the hypnobirthing woman come around here. Do you remember that was so I know. Funny. I mean, it was hysterical. I mean, the whole process was... I mean, I, I'm just, just, just for a moment, just pause, because... I, was I not at all resistant to the thought of a second home birth, given the experience mm. that we'd had the first time? I don't remember. Because I don't remember To be feeling honest, it. I don't remember. No, but I don't remember feeling I it. think I maybe because, I... I think the second time, because the first time you were distracted, you were busy, you were mm. still drinking at that time, you had a lot of work on, you didn't engage really mm. with what was going on. Until the... But this time, you, you you shared a lot of the information. You read a lot of this. We, we you know, we, well, we, did, we did the hypnobirthing together. I imagine my together. vagina was full of butter. Well, so she, so basically, this is the good story of a home birth. Okay. Do it, Dad. Do it. Do it. So we did home birthing, uh, hypnobirthing together. Very, very important shift in words. If you believe that our mind is intrinsically connected to our body, right? then you have to reset what we've been told mm. or, you know, all the way along the line for how many ever decades or hundreds of years. Right. From now, do not call your contraction a contraction. If you think about the word contraction. It contains. It contains. It contracts. It goes smaller. Right. You don't want to think about that. So the first thing that they taught us in the hip hypnobirthing was to think of it as a surge, as a wave. Right. And as a release. Think about yeah, if you think about that psychologically, that shift in thinking, contraction, no, oh, that's what I did. Every time I had a contraction in the first labour, no, and I closed my arms and I closed my body down and I screamed, no, and I took all my energy went to saying no mm. and shutting down my body. So it was all this stuff of, a sur oh, there's another surge coming, there's mm. another wave coming. Mm. Now, when you think about a wave, what do you think? A wave has a peak and then it comes down and it crashes against the mm. beach and and so and i i mean i i did the hypnobirthing cd every day mm. and i fell asleep every day about four o'clock i did this mm. now two things happened there one that was going in anyway and two i was resting every day and having sleep i cannot stress to you how important those naps are in the build-up to doing that both mark and i have run marathons mm. and we know how important that sleep is mm. I remember once doing a half marathon and i'd had three days of like the most brilliant sleep mm. and i ran the fastest i've ever run in my life and that's a really really important thing if you've come to this podcast to get really good tips on how to have a beautiful home birth start with your diet your exercise and sleep mm. and really being the kindest you can to yourself, mm. VIP yourself. I'm not talking in a bridezilla way, I'm pregnant and uh, but I'm just a quiet, mm. take yourself off, have a sleep, listen to music, talk to your baby. Don't, don't, if people, if, if there's an aggressive, horrible atmosphere going around, try and walk away from it. This is a precious, precious time. And well, all the time running up to that day of birth is, is included. In what you're about. I mean, I wonder whether in retrospect, because of course all of these things added to a much more positive and, 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 and sort of 
synchronized and smoothly running sort of delivery and birth of sorts, which we'll talk about because it was by contrast so much quicker than, than Maddie's. But I do wonder, and a tip bit of advice to dads out there who are kind of engaging in this. I think dads forever will, I think men generally always, always prepare prefer, to get visceral well, and no, men, men, are always, men will always prefer a quick, functional, practical solution to something than something that's incredibly holistic and off the book. But here's my line to you guys. I lay there and did hypnobirthing with you quite a few times with the woman. She came and, mm, and she was, times. you know, mud on your body is flowing with butter and all of this. And I felt like they were batshit crazy at first. And then eventually I just had to get rid of my own sort of resistance, my own doubts. My own, and my own, yeah. And to be honest with you, what is that about? It's about not looking a twat. At, the, at a time like now, it's, of all the times, it's not up a moment to worry about how you're both going to come across. Or what. And that's why I wanted the intimacy of us having our baby yeah. at home without worrying what people were thinking of us. But, I just want to tell a really quick story yeah. on that, this. Some of you know this story. I've told this story before. Years ago, this woman that I knew, she was madly in love with her partner, madly. They were like mad, passionate couple. Got pregnant had this home birth and she said at one point she was on the floor bent over with blood and everything and the rush and she was having this amazing birth where she was screaming mm. and she was visceral and it was her child and this man that she loved and she was having this baby and she turned around and she looked at him and he was looking at her with disgust oh my god just horror at what she was and she said she knew in that minute she wasn't going to love him for the rest oh of her my. life God, there's no pressure, guys. Yeah. So what because she said there, because she was a bit she was a bit mad. She was a mad artist, but she said I realised he didn't want intimacy with me. Intimacy <laughs> isn't. It... Hang on a minute. No, let me please let me just <laughs> no, finish no, the story because no, it's not what I think. This is a story no, 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 I'm no, telling about somebody else. No, no. And she had said that he didn't want intimacy with her. He wanted sex with her, but he didn't really want to be mm. into, it wasn't enough, no. it wasn't enough for her. Mm. He, she wanted all encompassing love mm. where he would be looking at and going, oh my God, what an extraordinary being she is. Mm. Because you are, mm. women listening to this, you are totally extraordinary when you surge that baby out mm. of your body and don't let anybody make you feel anything other than that. What you do, is so extraordinary. Just makes me want to cry at just the brilliance of a woman's body and what they have to, what you have to go to psychologically to just. And and that's why I just want to finish these few tips. So, not a contraction. It's a surge or a wave. Not to say no, but to say yes. And these things that this hypnobirther gave me were pearls of absolute wisdom. These were golden nuggets. And it was my psyche that had, that, that had stopped me having the birth that I wanted here. It was up here more than anything else. And so, and she said to, to, so to think of it as a surge and you come up and yes, you reach the peak of the challenging moment. Don't say the pain, don't say the pain, say the power, because that power is what's gonna bring you your baby. And just keep saying, and this was what was really difficult for Mark. And for us, we did get the giggles a couple of times, didn't she? She said, so you are standing or you are sitting or you are leaning or you are crouching and you imagine your vagina as butter, mm. buttery, buttery, buttery vagina. And you say, yes. And you say, yes. Just and, like that. And, and, right, and so, and so <laughs> we, when we were doing the hypnobirthing practice, Mark had to put his hands on my shoulders and count. So, one, two, three, and he'd have to be pushing down on my shoulders and I would be going, yes, come, come, come. It's very hard not to get around, actually, when this is well, happening. <laughs> well, actually, a lot of, some women, like extreme there. birthers will have orgasms as they're giving birth because the rush, yes. the oxytocin is so incredible. Mm. So I, the best place for me to birth Kiki was on the toilet. Mm, so we, 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 have, we ended up with me on the toilet downstairs with our friend Rachel sat on the floor behind Mark, tiny bathroom, downstairs Lou, me on the toilet with Mark's hands on my shoulders. And I cannot tell you, Mark was an absolute, makes me well up. Mm -hmm. It couldn't have been in a hospital this wouldn't have happened in mm. this way mm. he was like my absolute lifeline 
And I felt, and you might not remember it this way because memory does a weird thing to us, but I do remember it. It was, we were so synchronized. Now, obviously it was probably for Mark, it was total hell. But because I was in the rush of oxytocin, I was almost in a meditative sort of like, um, um, this was the sound I was making. And, and he just kept counting. I remember your hair was long and it was hanging over your head and I was just going, count, count, count. Go, one, two, three. And we did this for hours. Mm. And he was shaking. And at one point he said, I've got to go for a wee. And I just said to Rachel, bucket. Mm. And she gave him a bucket and he had to open his trousers. <laughs> so you imagine his penis is practically in my face and he had to wee into Not the, the first bucket. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to hasten and to add that. Bucket! Bucket! Mm. That's what I was like. But I was so in my power. Mm. And I know lots of people just go, oh my God, she's making me sick. And she thinks she's. And people hate it when I talk about this. But I feel so passionate about it. I was like in the power, absolutely, of mm. womanhood. And the surge and the wave. And I'm 42 years old. And I'm just like roaring like a lion, bringing this baby and saying, yes, yes. And I was imagining her face. I wasn't saying, no, I'm scared it's going to mm. come out. I was thinking, yeah. And I was just saying, open, 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 open. Every single contraction, I said, open. Mm. And that, and she told us, the hypnobirther, when you say the word open, open she said imagine that's your cervix and open your mouth and open and he couldn't leave my, you were not allowed to leave me for no. one split no. second you got me through that birth like a team of gynecologists well, we i don't know what we didn't have the she midwife there, there. <laughs> and then in the, the last law. half yeah. hour she came and then i was like i was in control of everything like, we're going in there so we moved into the sitting mm. room I bent over the sofa. We came into the really tough, mm. last, not tough, challenging, never say difficult, challenging, surge, wave, rush. It's the rush, the contractions rush. I said, I was so passionate about this. And then, so I was on all fours. She gave you some gas and air. Mm. And I had my gas and air. I had gas and air and I hadn't had it. Nothing. Mm. And so suddenly this gas and air right at the end was just incredible. I've never had a high like it. Mm. I was as high as a kite because I had so much oxytocin, this feel-good drug mm. that comes so in. You didn't I transitioned. Take gas in there. Did no, you? I did, I oh, did. In this right. last one, to take to, to, to for her mm. to come out. And then she came out at the end and it was just like a dream. It, it was, was like, so amazing. Yeah, and it was moment. on the floor and the sun poured through mm. the window. And we've got the most incredible photo of you with your hair just sweating, falling forward, and you just and your face is looking at out, and I remember the exact words you said. Because after the miscarriages and everything, I, you know, maybe I hadn't really considered how much you didn't believe it was going to happen as well, because I didn't believe it was going to happen, and you just said, you just, <laughs> you just went, she's here, she's actually here. And she gave this huge smile, just, and she's still got that huge smile, mm -hmm. but she just this huge smile. And then my favourite photo of my whole life, and this to me sums up home birth, with my friend Rachel's hand on my hand, and it was just, it's this beautiful photo, isn't it, with her hand on my hand. And that's why I feel so passionate about the power of people that you love around you, believing that you can do this extraordinary thing, which is to surge and wave and bring your child into the world just through breath which is what i did what with with you know my incredible husband just counting me through those breaths the breath brings that baby to you and if you if you're able to do the breath work and do some of that deep breathing and, and do this hypnobirthing you can have this you know incredible mm. And I, and I would incredible, like incredible, but incredible experience you can. And I'd like to stress again. I mean, I think for men, you know, because we don't give birth and we don't, it doesn't happen in our bodies. We don't ever get that sense of oneness with another being, and it continues obviously way after birth with breastfeeding and that and that filial connection, umbilical connection that you have with a with a mum. 
I have to say, I think of all the experiences I've ever had, and as we know, I've taken a lot of drugs and I've drunk a lot in my time and I've done a lot of stupid things. I've never encountered total fusion and unity of body, mind and spirit with another human like I had in that period with you. I didn't feel different to you. I knew, I mean, you know, it would sound like a wanker, you know, I know I didn't give birth, but we felt as, as, as one. united as one yeah. organism as one could have been in the process, I felt we were. And so in that sense, it's why we wanted to start, what's well, the way it happened, you know, from one experience where I couldn't have been more scared, more out of control, more fearful, more circumspect of the whole concept of home birthing, I would not have it any other way yeah. than the way we had it with Kiki. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and exactly. we'd have it again like that if we were, to, if, you know, if we'd have ever had another child. So, yeah, it was an amazing time. It was an amazing experience. And you were such a remarkable, strong, brave, you know, focused. I mean, you you were just true. You were you were Mother Nature herself. And for a little coda to the whole story, those who follow us will know this very well, but the, if you, the exact spot where Kiki was born in the mm. lounge, if you draw a perpendicular line directly, and I mean directly from the very spot on the ground upwards yeah. into the room above, which is currently now Kiki's room. So Kiki was born downstairs. Maddie landed on exactly the same spot. Have you since discovered that there is a spa under the There's house a spring, there? Yeah. And and you know the thing is that's a just just as a, a a little thing at the end is that both places that I had the babies were the two places that I definitely wasn't going to have the baby, right? <laughs> Isn't that funny? Which just goes to, and yet once I was going to where I was, nothing was going to stop no. me. That was I would have fought people off to get to yeah. that. Place. Something drew me to that, and that animal yeah. instinct that I want, that I know that we have, that we've got so far away from with medical intervention and everything. I wanted that. Mm. I wanted that in all its glory and mm. all its filth and all its everything. I mean, I remember there being blood and fluids everywhere and our friend Pat mopping it all up and just, and for a lot of people, that's not just mm. not what they want. And I and I think that that's totally what everyone should mm. move towards the birth that they think that mm. they want. What they want. And I am not one of these home birthers said, oh, it's ridiculous, and everyone should home birth. Everyone should have exactly what they want. And I had exactly what I wanted in the end. So, high five. Mm. Two beautiful kids. Oh my God, they're so always so blessed. There you go, guys. And um, for any men out there, just make sure you're not looking like that at any point. <laughs>